Chapter 2. The Other Perspective Hey, Papyrus, how's the chicken salad turning out? You asked, walking in the kitchen as you stretched. It took six months, but it looks like all those long hours of work were finally going to be paid off. The machine was finally repaired, and Sand sounded certain he had the right algorithms to undo what was nicknamed the incident. The moment when the same said machine pulled a whole bunch of alternate timeline skeletons in this universe, and then exploded. Papyrus had his back turned, scarf sliding along the armor. You are mistaken, human. I am actually making spaghetti! Papyrus said, with his back still turned, attention solely focused on the pasta boiling. You almost sighed. After all these months, you were still the human, and never heard Papyrus call you by name. Oh, sorry, I thought you said, Human, I can see you still don't know the intricacies of dating, but sometimes one must adapt for their date. Papyrus said, stirring the bowl. You knew the intricacies of dating just fine. You were dating now for crying out loud. Well, if you consider going out in secret and telling no one the stuff you do together, dating. You were suddenly feeling depressed and knew you had to talk to Blue tonight. No more holding it off. Tiffany was able to share feelings and declarations of love with multiple skeletons for crying out loud. You should have no trouble doing it with one. My bad. Would you like help cooking? You asked, approaching from the side. I'm not certain that's a good idea, human. Don't you have allergies when it comes to pasta? Papyrus asked, imaginary eyebrow arching. That was the excuse given when you threw up after eating Papyrus's spaghetti the first time. It was supposed to be the special friendship spaghetti night for everyone to bond. Only a week after the incident, you and Tiffany being the only humans invited. Difference was, Sans apparently liked Tiffany more than you, which is why he sent her food to the void with his. Turned out, every brother pair had their judge send the meal away when Papyrus wasn't looking. You were the odd one out with no partner in crime, having to just eat the burnt pasta and watery tomato sauce. After having the worst two days of your life, everyone agreed to just say it was allergies. You still didn't get any help from another skeleton when it came to future meals of terror. You picked at Edge's lasagna, making sure not to eat broken glass. You didn't even try to eat the charcoal meat from Black's burrito. Your plate barely touched while every judge voided food for themselves and their brother. Well, except for Sans, who did it for Tiffany. Papyrus could eat them all whole while totally oblivious on what was going on. It made for an awkward ending to some dinners. The only meal you did totally finish and not throw up was Blue's Tacos, an outcome which only happened because you checked what ingredients he was going to use beforehand and switched the non-edible glitter with actual edible glitter. Maybe that's why he warmed up to you more compared to the rest. Well, I should be fine as long as I don't eat it. Maybe I can just grate the Parmesan cheese for you, you said, a little tired of continuing the allergy charade. You really did wish you could try a spaghetti again since he knew how to cook it. Sans and Tiffany, though, insisted you stay with the allergy lie to not hurt Pap's feelings. Why, thank you, human. Please, go ahead, Papyrus said, rewarding you with a smile. You pulled the Parmesan cheese from the fridge and grabbed a plate. The sound of stirring and cheese being chipped away filled the air. So, where are you taking Tiffany? To the park! The weather looks nice for it. Yes, it does. You, um, taking the convertible? Of course! The silence stretched out afterwards, and you were trying your best to not slump your shoulders. Papyrus would talk a mile a minute with literally every other resident in the mansion, including even Edge, who returns every word with insults. The difference in small talk, though, was obvious when you and Papyrus were alone. He'd answer questions, just not offer anything beyond short answers. The only reason you knew he was originally going to make chicken salad was because he gushed about it to Sands an hour ago. Well, I'm done. Uh, see you around. Thank you, human! You headed towards your room, grabbing your jacket and key. The post office wasn't allowed to directly deliver packages to the mansion. It made the skeletons too nervous, having random strangers at the door.
so packages had to be picked up at the post office branch, which was 30 minutes away. You got an email that morning saying Red's chopper part was delivered. You got pulled into ordering it since you had a good relation with the business, which dealt in steel products. Was able to get it custom made per his specifications. Usually what you ordered from them was custom parts for the machine, which could bend the laws of physics. You heard the tapping of a foot before turning and sighed as you saw the familiar sight of Black looking impatient. He was wearing a violet-colored shirt and dress pants, always dressed high class around the mansion. In one hand, he carried a stack of packages with ease, but you weren't fooled. You knew for a fact some of those boxes were so heavy they could cause you to pull your back. You still got flashbacks of when you had to stay in bed and peg Blue to get you some Tylenol. Black accused you of faking. Human, I have some packages for you to deliver since you are going to the post office, Black said, dropping them to the floor. You weren't crazy about how the bottom ones crunched up under all the weight. We talked about this, Black. As Sans' assistant, my job is to do anything which pertains to repairing the machine in the basement. Delivering your packages isn't covered under the job, you said. You are correct, it is not, but the loan payment I gave you does need to be compensated for. Black said with a smirk. When first starting to work for Sands, the income was good, but not good enough to keep the debt collectors away. Maybe if you had gotten such a good-paying job when first starting out in college, it would have been different. But you ended up missing six payments and, like so many other college students, found yourself attached to a mountain of loan debt. Black offered to help you pay off the interest and penalty of your loan so you had nothing past due. You couldn't stop recalling how in Tiffany's case, Black already paid the full amount of the loan. You thought the agreement was you'd pay him back a little bit each month until the debt was settled. What wasn't said was the other favors Black insisted also needed to be done, like take his clothes to the dry cleaners, bring food upstairs for him, or in this case, take packages to the post office. Not at the cost of you getting me injured. Don't forget you caused me to hurt my back and I couldn't help Sans for a week on the machine, you said, recalling the memory with a wince. That was the point when Sans finally intervened. It would have been nice if the laid-back skeleton was willing to help out earlier. Good grief. If you're so worried about your back, then I'll have Mutt take the heaviest when I finally find the useless monster. Black said, grabbing a package in the middle. The bottom package almost appeared to give a sigh of relief no longer a scrunched up. Fine, you said, not wanting to start a fight you knew you couldn't win. With a grunt, you lifted the stack of packages, which was far from being light. You really would have hurt your back again if you had taken the full load. I make it snappy. There's fabrics in there a tailor needs to make a dress for my lady, Black said, actually taking a pose of putting a finger in the air as you walked by. Yeah, yeah, you muttered wondering why Black always acted like he was in a renaissance fair. The drive in your old Honda to the post office was uneventful. He took the liberty of opening Red's package, making sure the part met the specifications you sent them. Everything looked in order, and you went to his room to deliver it, only to find he wasn't there, but his brother's head quickly popped into view from another room. My worthless brother went to that detestable bar. Since you appear to be looking for him, go pick him up before he's too drunk. Edge said with a wave of his hand. Apparently you were doing favors for even people who didn't help you pay your student loan. You supposed it wouldn't hurt. Red could sometimes be okay company at Grilby's. You both had an interest in machines, which sometimes led to conversations on how we should customize the Road King chopper he was going to work on. So, back into your old Honda you went, arriving at Gobi's bar. The sun was only now setting. Even Red didn't normally go to the bar this early. Maybe you could take it as a good sign of not finding him crazy drunk. Hey, Rita! Come on over! Or maybe you really need to work on your deductive skills. You were definitely a far cry from Sherlock Holmes. You reluctantly head in, noticing Grilby the fire elemental, practically giving Red the death stare. A couple of other monsters were rolling their eyes and scooting away from him at the bar. Um, hey Red, your brother sent me to get you back home. Guessing you're too drunk to shortcut? You said, giving Grilby an awkward wave. 
The elemental gave you a nod as he cleaned a glass. Ah, oh, you don't say, Red slurred, one bony hand keeping his head off the bar counter. Well, at least he wasn't angry drunk. He was in the red sweater and fur-lined jacket, black shorts showing thick bone legs underneath. Yep. Oh, and your part arrived, left it in your room. Good job, Tiffany understudy. I, um, what? You asked, confused. Was this some sort of pun joke? If so, you were totally missing it. Tiffany understudy, that's what you are. You know the replacement for when we can't hang out with Tiffany. Stupid paps is getting out tonight. Red growled, for the first time sounding angry as he took a swing of mustard. That's not funny, you said, almost whispering it. You noticed there was suddenly a lot more attention on the two of you. Red, you're out of line. Rita, you don't need to take this. I'll call a taxi for him. Grilby said, flames flickering faster on his head. No, it's, um, okay. I'm already here. I can put up with him until we get home. You said with a shaky smile. The bartender stared at you for a second before shaking his head. All right, kid. Don't know why you are putting yourself through this. Why am I putting myself through this? Maybe because, in a way, this was an opportunity to find out something. You always knew how the relation between Tiffany and the skeletons worked. They adored and loved her, and she adored and loved them back. You were always the odd one out, though. Never close to any of them, except for blue, axe, and traps. The first being a skeleton you started going out with in secret. The other two are pretty much your best friends. You weren't ignorant of how Tiffany barely gave them any attention, and it was probably a factor. Although you also got friendship points for trying to help them get the barrier of their world down. The two of you got in the car, in Red's case, crawling into the car, closing the doors. Taking one of Red's old pun jokes, you mustered up your courage and opened your mouth. So why did you call me Tiffany Understudy? Ah, you know, because you like... An understudy. Tiffany is the big star and the one we all want to see. But sometimes the big star gets sick or has to hang out with stupid skeletons like Paps. So the understudy comes in. Not as special to look at, but hey, you get the job done of trying to keep us entertained. Red finished with a playful punch. Well, maybe not as playful as it could be, you winced from the pain. Do, do all the others see me that way? Does Blue see me that way? Yeah, most of them. <laughs> Except for those freaks you hang out with. They're not freaks, you snapped, turning a little too sharply at a corner. Axe and traps couldn't help what they went through, what they became of it, what they became because of it. See, you three are practically a tripod. Now don't feel all bad. We're glad you got your mad scientist brains to help us with the machine. I mean... I love Tiffany, but I wouldn't trust her to fix a toaster. But why can't you see me as just me, a reader, instead of as someone's replacement? I don't know. Guess it's because you just look so dull compared to our favorite girl, Red said with a yawn. If you didn't know any better, you'd say your soul cracked just a little from those words. You wanted this, though. You wanted to find out how you stood with everyone. Now, the only question was what you were going to do about it. Red spared you more of his words when you parked by letting himself out and heading to his room. You took a moment to lean back on your car, staring at the starry sky. A couple of months ago, you and Blue started to hang out, away from everyone else. It wasn't hard to do without anyone noticing. Even Stretch was always busy with, well, napping. Also, other than Sands, he knew the most about the machine and helped with it. As the contraption appeared closer and closer to being finished, Sands and Stretch ended up spending a lot more hours in the basement. This left Blue with a lot of time without his brother, and you didn't exactly have a crazy social life. Also, you were required to use a bedroom at the mansion as part of your job. At first, it was just things like going to a restaurant together as friends or to the arcade. But as the outings continued, things got a bit more intimate. 
Hugs turn into kisses before going into the mansion. Sometimes you would fondle and rub against each other while watching a movie in private in his room. You kept it to yourselves because Blue said his brother would get annoying and protective, probably lecture him on going out with a human who he didn't see as safe as Tiffany. Actually, you're pretty sure he almost said special. No one caught on to it, except for maybe Tiffany. A couple of days ago, she barged into Blue's room to find you sitting on Blue's lap, big arms around your waist. She got a look on her face, which you couldn't really identify, and left. That's when you decided you wanted to not keep it a secret. It was going to come out anyway, and you wanted it on your terms. I don't want to be an understudy, you muttered, leaving the car and heading inside. You heard noises from various areas of the house, making you nervous about having a serious talk with so many people nearby. But this had to be done, and you weren't going to hold it off any longer. The walk to Blue's room felt like it took forever, but was probably only a minute. You noticed the lights off and knew Blue liked to go to bed early since he got up at five in the morning for his jog with Papyrus and Edge. You suddenly knew how you were going to do this. If you turned on the lights, tried to go slow on the talk, you'd probably chicken out right before getting to the hard part. So, you'll just open the door, leave the lights off, and say your piece. Then, turn on the lights and see how he reacted. Right. You could do this. Hand turned the doorknob, swinging it open. You were so scared you didn't even look directly at the bed as you took a deep breath. You heard a startled shift and Blue say your name in a high-pitched voice. Good. He was awake. Now, just get the words out of your mouth. So, I, uh, I just, um, I wanted to say I really like spending time with you, Blue, and I'm hoping we can be more, I mean, I'm hoping we can tell everyone how close we got and get even closer. I know I'm kind of shy and socially awkward compared to some humans, but I think if you'll give me a chance, then you'll find I'm worth it. All you heard was heavy breathing from the bed, and with a swallow, you went to turn on the lights. A reader, wait! You always wondered how Blue would look under his clothes. Sometimes when you fondled each other, you'd pull his shirt up to brush his ribs. Now you were getting a view of a lot more. Naked ribs, chest, and broad shoulders. Saying it appeared like a skeleton body was off. More like marrow shaping into a beefy man. It would have normally been exciting to see if Tiffany wasn't lying under it naked. Oh, sorry, you whispered, already turning and leaving. Apologizing was the right response, correct? You did walk in unannounced, after all. Reader, I'm sorry. I mean, we didn't mean to. I... Reader, please wait and let us explain. The only word you could use to describe what you felt was numb. Like you were having an out-of-body experience, and all your senses had become dull. As you took a final step down the stairs and entered the living room, you realized you really should have paid more attention to your surroundings. Every other skeleton was there, looking ready to start a movie. Even Red, who was rubbing his head, probably dragged from his bed by Edge. You heard the stomping of steps to see Blue and Tiffany come down. Blue, thankfully, in a white t-shirt and sweatpants. Tiffany wrapped in a silk purple robe, no doubt another gift from Black. Reader, we honestly didn't. Blue, let me handle this, said Tiffany, stepping in front of him. Reader, please understand, the two of us were just expressing our feelings to each other. I can't tell you how upset I am that you had to find out that way. You're lying. You knew all about getting embarrassed and flustered. You knew exactly how a person reacted when they felt embarrassed at getting caught in something. Because awkward you ended up in that position way too many times. She was saying the words right, but her facial expression, her body language was so calm, she might as well have been drinking tea and reading a book. She wasn't flushed with embarrassment, and you knew all this was just an act. She probably would have preferred to continue her lovemaking with Blue. Why did it take you so long to realize how fake she sounded when actually looking at her? Reader, me and Blue share a bond, a soul bond, just like with... It doesn't work that way. Tiffany blinked in surprise at you interrupting. A couple of monsters as well. 
you weren't the type to interrupt anyone, let alone the wonderful great Tiffany. But a lump of determination was forming inside you. You weren't just going to let everyone say this was okay. Monsters and humans create a soul bond after they have sex. You can't use that as an excuse for sleeping with him after you caught us getting close. You were literally with seven other guys, but a couple of days after you notice me in the lap of blue, you suddenly say you had feelings for him as well? This isn't love. This is just you not wanting to even let one of them go. Now she was finally showing a reaction. Cheeks turning bright red, eyes narrowing. This was an embarrassment, though. This was anger at being called out. Blue's head was practically asking for whiplash as he swung it back and forth between the two humans. Uncalled for, reader. Tiffany just realized how awesome my bro is, and she tells me all the time how great he is. Stretch said, getting up. It was soon followed by more skeletons standing up. All eyes on you. The one to dare question Tiffany's wonderful character. I think this human outstate is welcome. Quite frankly, I don't know why we allowed him to hang around this long, Black said with a snort. I agree. He's lucky we view him as so weak, or I'd be taking a pound of flesh from him in a fight. Edge growled, crossing his arms. Give the word, my lord, and I'll throw him out, Mutt said, one eye glowing violet as he took a puff from his smoking doggy treat. Sands, blue and red, had been silent, as well as Papyrus, who squeezed his hands in agitation, not enjoying the display of an argument in his home. You had to admit, as harsh as their words were, they didn't hurt as much as you expected. Maybe, for once, the not-so-close relationship with them was working in your favor. Trust Tiffany, though, to be able to change that. Oh, please, let's not fight. The soul bond between P and Blue just formed, and this shouldn't be a time for everyone to be angry. Tiffany said, doing her classic hand-on-heart move. This time you were certain your soul cracked a little. You blinked as your eyes watered slightly. No way you were giving anyone in here the satisfaction of seeing you cry. Reader, while you were a great help with completing our machine, I'm afraid I'm going to have to terminate your employment here. Please collect your belongings and leave. Sans said, appearing almost apologetic. No two weeks' notice, evidently. Just kick him to the curb as fast as can be. Was it his imagination, or did Tiffany flinch slightly at the words, completing our machine? Wait, my Sans and Papyrus still need Project Battering Ram. Not so fast, you said, noticing Sans pause as he was turning to head to the basement. Per our verbal contract, I stay employed not just until the machine is fixed, but also until Project Battering Ram is done as well. I'll find residents elsewhere, but I expect to have the same resources to help Axe and Traps break the barrier in their world. Hey, we'll deal with it, kid, Stretch said, scratching his chin. Project Battering Ram was, to put it simply, looking to use human technology which could break the barrier. Axe and Traps were the only ones who came from a world where the barrier existed. Everyone else was pulled here right after their barrier was destroyed. You can't. None of you were involved in any way with developing the project. Sans, if you're going to cut off my funding for this, then I want to hear it directly from your lips. I want to hear you say you're going to let thousands of monsters die of starvation just because everyone here hates my guts. You were shaking. You were terrified. Not of being hurt, even though there had been a lot of threats. Terrified of letting your two best friends down. They needed this, and you couldn't let their only chance at freedom get away just because you wanted to run from here and never look back. Blue finally moved, taking a step past Tiffany, who stiffened. Reader, we don't hate you. I mean, I don't... All right, kid. You get your funding. Now get your stuff and get out. Sans said, no longer appearing so much apologetic as annoyed. With a huff, you nodded and headed to your room, not sparing Blue a glance. No one helped, of course, not even Papyrus who looked like he almost offered a hand, but stopped under the glare of Edge next to him. It was grueling and hard, but maybe you should thank Black for all those times he made you carry stuff, because apparently you developed enough muscle to pull it all off by yourself. 
You drove to a cheap motel, using your credit card to get a room. You'd call your sans and papyrus tomorrow morning and explain what happened. You wish you had a moment to say goodbye to them before they kicked you out. As you laid in bed, you blinked in surprise when you realized tears were going down your cheeks. Looks like you couldn't hold it in any longer. You sniffled and sobbed a little in your pillow, torn between being glad no one was witnessing your crying and wanting someone there to hold you.